Okay, so let's uh, finish our AVL uh, implementation here. Uh, then I'll um, uh, I'll talk about the homework assignment. Uh, deals with sparse matrices, so we need to talk about what sparse matrices are a little bit, and um, the Yale algorithm also needs a little explanation because it's uh, it's not really difficult, but it's hard to understand when you first see it. So hopefully, after I explain it, it'll kind of make sense how it works. Um, okay, <clears throat> so the problem we were having before we uh, took a break was that uh, a tree doesn't know whether or not it's the parent tree or a regular tree, right? Okay, we, we, we don't know that. What I'm going to do here is we're going to create a private static top root variable here that will start off as null. Uh, and this guy is going to be a binary tree. <clears throat> All right, so that's top root. Uh, and actually, I'm not going to make him yeah, null. What does static mean? Static means he only exists once. And he's owned by the binary tree class. What do you mean by exists once? Yeah, um, I just think about the singleton. It's like a singleton. Okay. So static means that every instance of binary trees do not get mult their own instance of this. That guy exists one time. All right. And what we're going to do is we're going to have two versions of our constructor. One constructor that takes no parameters. Okay. One constructor that takes no parameters and sets everything to null. Blah blah blah. And then ultimately sets uh, binary tree dot top root equal to this. So we'll let that value know that we are the top root. Okay? Um, this is one way we can handle this. One way we can handle this. Um, this is the internal way we can handle this. We could also have a singleton outside of here to do it, but this will be the internal way we'll handle this. We're going to have a second constructor, public binary tree, um, and then this guy will take in a is child. Actually, wrong language here. <laughs> Boolean is child. Okay. <clears throat> if is child just do that stuff if it's not well we're only ever going to call this guy if he is a child well we we have to make it uh, if in here because this guy needs to be differentiated from this guy but I actually, I get what you're saying. If we know we're only going to call him externally from this, the if is a waste of time. You're right. We, we could just say this. I think it maybe becomes confusing then because technically somebody, well, let's see, technically somebody outside of this class could choose, couldn't choose to use it because we made it private now. So See, in another language that doesn't require the uh, constructors that have the same name as the class name, we could have just had uh, something called like internal binary tree or something like that. Yeah. Let's just leave it like this. This is fine. All right. <clears throat> so if we call this version of the constructor, we're setting all the same values, but we're not setting the top root. All right. So what is the who? Um, constructor. Oh, it's just saying it, we've never actually used it. All right. So I made it private. That way, somebody external from this class doesn't accidentally use it. So now I'll come down here. And when we create our new binary tree, 
We'll just throw trues in here. So we're calling that other version of the uh, constructor, the one that advertises that he's a child. That make sense? Yeah. All right. So now when we get to this bottom part, let's go ahead and prove this real quick. When we get down here to our um, is balanced inside of our add guy here, we're not asking if this is balanced. What we're actually asking is if binary tree dot top root is balanced. So if that guy is not balanced, then we need to do something with him. That makes sense? All right. So we'll start our tree off at the top rather than where we're currently sitting. The alternative uh, implementation of this would be build our trees so that we can walk back up them. All right. We have uh, right. Uh, because we already know that we're kind of localized where the problem is, but understand that rebalancing a tree is actually expensive. So having some extra expense here at the uh, um, sake of understanding it, it's not that big of a deal. I guess I would, uh, I would say. All right. Let me think. Oh, and if you want. We can look at it after class to make you feel better so you can sleep. <laughs> that will that help? All right. So remind me in case I'm in a rush to get out. We'll we'll look at it. All right. So in any case, um, if it's not balanced, then we need to rebalance. Okay. And to rebalance, we're going to call the rebalance algorithm of a tree. All right. So I'm going to create a, a function here, public. Actually, let's make it private because we only use that guy from within this class. So things that are private are only accessible within the class in which they were defined. We're inside the binary tree class here so we can access all the private members. That's why we could do something like this. That's why that worked. All right. Without us accidentally exposing it to the external, the external world. It's for our internal use only. Um, okay, so we're going to say private void rebalance. All right, and this guy is going to do whatever it means to rebalance. All right, so if we are out of balance, then we're going to go ahead and say binary tree dot top root dot rebalance. All right, that's what we do when we're out of balance. We rebalance. All right, so now what we're going to do here is we're just going to print stuff out inside of rebalance. All right, we're going to print out, uh, um, here's our get, let's see, where do we do our depth? Get max depth of left and right. All right, that's fine. All right, so if we're calling rebalance here, we know that we have a left and a right. Actually, do we necessarily know that? We don't necessarily know that. So we have to write it. Um, just follow me here. So we're going to say int left depth is equal to, we'll start off as negative 1, int right depth is equal to negative 1. We would not be in here if it wasn't already out of bounds. So we're not interested in whether or not it's balanced. We just want to get the depths of our two sides. All right. So if this dot left is not equal to null, then we're going to say left depth is equal to this dot left dot get max depth. Okay. No, because we're not, we're not counting. I just want to know what the depth is of the left. It'll make sense here in a second. If this dot right is not equal to null, right depth is equal to this dot right dot get max depth. So after this, left depth and right depth will have numbers in them. Could be negative one. We know they won't both be negative one. We can't be out of balance with an empty tree, right? 
The only reason we are even in this function right now is because our tree is out of balance. Therefore, we need to ask the question, which side is it out of balance? If left is greater than right, it's left heavy. If right is greater than left, it's right heavy. Okay, so let's just start with that top part. That answers that first question. Is it left left? Well, is it left something or is it right something? All right. So we'll say if left depth is greater than right depth, we'll just say system.out.println tree is left heavy. Else tree is right heavy. Make sense? All right. So let's go ahead and do this. Now understand that we are doing this every single time we add something. All right. So right now we're saying if it's unbalanced, do this. Else, let's just print out system.out.println tree is balanced just for, to give us some feedback, okay? So right now, we probably don't want to add a thousand things like we're doing right now. Let's go back to the, let's go back to the hundred things. So as we're doing a hundred things, let's also get rid of the get smallest and here, we'll just comment those out since I'll push this up to the, to GitHub when we're done. All right, so every single time we add, it's going to ask the question, are we balanced? And it's either going to print out, yes, we're balanced, or it's going to print out whether we're left or right heavy. All right. Oh, hold on. We have some. Our is balanced is a little bit uh, out of balance here. Uh, not out of balance, I'm sorry. Our is balanced is, is a little verbose is what I meant. We're doing, we're a little chatty in here. So let's get rid of that. That was just testing before. All right. Now we should be in a little bit better shape. All right. Well, it was balanced for a little bit. Then we were left heavy. So that would have been a rotation. And now we're left heavy, left heavy, left heavy. Now keep in mind, though, that uh, we would have done a rotation in here. So we wouldn't have necessarily been left heavy for all this time. It ended up self-correcting, right? <laughs> Eventually, we added enough crap to the right side to bring it back into balance. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not actually doing rotations right now. We're just letting ourselves know that it's out of balance, okay? And which side? So essentially, by, by doing this, we now know the first part of this. Is it left something or is it right something? Okay. Once we have that, the next thing is we need to walk down to the right depth to find out which of the other guys it is. Okay. Let's go back into here. So here's rebalance. Okay, so inside of rebalance... If we're in here, we know the tree is left heavy. So we know we have to traverse down the left-hand side of the tree to find the imbalance. We know the depth of the left tree as well. Okay? So right now we start off, if we have a tree of, well, really, uh, the, let's, let's think about this. Well, we need to go down first. We just need to figure out how far down we have to go because I need to look at how we get max depth real quick. Get max depth assumes it starts off as a 1 because that guy exists. And then... No, I don't think we want to say 1 plus... Since we're starting it off as a one, I just think we want to say plus equals. Actually, it, it actually means the same thing, doesn't it? 
it does mean the same thing. All right. So left depth is going to be equal to whatever it already is plus the depth of the other one because we already have a single level here. So we are assuming a, a 1 as our top. So we never have something of depth 0. We always have a depth of 1 or greater. Okay. So that means that when I print out my how off balance it is. Let's just say with depth of plus left depth. Let's make this right depth. Okay. So now the message will tell us specifically how deep that side is. So we'll get a little bit more, a little bit more verbose. All right, so tree was balanced. Tree was right heavy with a depth of six on the right. Tree was right heavy with a depth of seven. Depth of 10, depth of 11. All right, so that's how far we have to go to get to the very bottom of the tree. So from the top of the tree, the left subtree is going to be depth of 1 down to, here for example, a 7. And we're going to keep going until we hit the very bottom of that tree. Okay? But we need to back off by 1 from that. So if I know that we're left heavy, that's this guy right here, I'm going to start traversing that tree so far down. How far down? Let's just say that I know that this guy has a depth of, this is 1, this is 2, this is 3. That's how our max depth currently currently works, right? Okay, so this guy has a depth of 3 on the, on the left-hand side. So we know we need to go down one traversal. We're going to follow the left node by 1. So follow the left tree just one time. So depth of 3, we're already at depth 1. So we need to get to depth two. Okay, so it's going to be max depth minus one and then less than that for the number of traversals we're going to go. All right, so really we can say max depth, which in this case will be three, minus two will be the number of times we need to run down the list All right, because we used a one-based index. Um, okay, so once we have that, we know we're left depth, and we can test this as well. Because if we get down to the bottom of the tree, if I get down to this guy, if we're in the right place, the max depth of this guy is what? Should be two, right? Right? So if I position myself correctly, I should be able to ask, what is the max depth of, the, of where you're currently sitting? And it should be a 2, okay? Because this is a depth of 1, this is a depth of 2, okay? So let's try to position ourselves there. So we're going to run down the tree, always taking the max depth side, okay? But we're going to do that some number of times. The number of times we're going to do it is our original max depth minus 2. All right. So if we're right here, we need to do something left depth minus 2 number of times. All right, so this essentially runs down the tree. Run down the tree to one level off the bottom. All right, so how do we run down the tree? Well, we know initially that it's going that we're going to go left, but since we're repeating this thing over and over again, we need to ask our left and right which one's the deeper, uh, which one's the deeper tree. Right? Okay. 
um, in actuality here, mm, ah, we're fine in here. I was going to go and do it a different way, but this is okay. All right, so we'll go ahead and run down the tree. We're going to start with a left move, but I actually have to write the logic for the left move, even though it's a... Uh, um, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to say we have a left depth and right depth. I'm going to have to reuse those variables. This isn't a great implementation, but we're going to rate it anyways. So we'll say left depth is equal to negative 1. We'll say right depth is equal to negative 1. Then we're going to basically ask these exact same questions. That'll update left depth and right depth from where we are right now. Okay. Now, where we are right now is actually the current tree. So what we need to say is binary tree, cur tree is equal to this. That's what we're going to do before our for loop. This is kind of like when we traverse through a linked list. We started at cur node and walked yep. down the tree. Okay, so our cur tree is going to start at the top. As long as we need to keep running, okay, which is what this for loop says, okay, run down the tree until we hit a, a depth um, that's two, well, it's one off the bottom, but because of the way we count, we have to do subtract two from there. Okay, we'll go ahead and say left, de left depth, right depth. If left depth, uh, if, if we're not going to say this dot left, we're going to say cur tree dot left is not equal to null, then set the left depth equal to cur tree dot left. If cur tree dot right is not equal to null, then cite right depth equal to cur tree dot right dot get max depth. Okay. Then we're going to ask the question. So after this, after those two if statements, left depth and right depth tell us which direction we need to go. We need to go to the direction of the greater of those two values. Okay. If left depth is greater than right depth, then we're going to go ahead and say cur tree is equal to cur tree dot left. Else cur tree is equal to cur tree dot right. That's how we run the tree. So we know we need to run the tree this number of times. Each time through, we are at a fork in the road. We ask, which fork leads to the longer path? If it's the left fork, update my current tree variable to be his left tree. because That's the longer fork. That's where I'll find the depth, the, the longest depth of my tree. Else, update my cur tree to the right path. Make sense? All right. So when we're done with this for loop, cur tree should be sitting at a tree that is one off the bottom. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and, uh, and I'm actually going to move this code here in a, in a second, but we're going to go ahead and write this first. So we're going to say system dot out dot print lin cur tree dot get max depth. Near the bottom, we'll get cur tree get max depth. That guy should read a two if we're where we need to be. Okay. Now we're doing this logic every single time we need to run down the tree. Okay, we're doing this on left depth minus 2. So let's take that same logic. Even though this is also bad programming, but whatever. I'd rather be verbose so we can see the algorithm then. 
So otherwise, we are right heavy. So we're going to go to right depth minus 2. Reset those two variables. Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. I can't do that. I need to say int num steps is equal to right depth minus 2. And then we're going to change this to num steps. Otherwise, I break right depth right here. We're going to use that same code up here for num steps. This guy will be left depth. So we'll just set a variable for num steps here. That way we can reuse our left and right depths there. Okay, so we're going to run down the tree. Should get to the final. We're near the bottom. Gives us our current max depth. Similar thing over here. Should do the same thing. And we're hoping when we see near, when we hope when we see a printout that says near the bottom, it says two. All right, so it looks like we came up one short, so our math was was off. So we need to not subtract one. To subtract two, it must be subtract one. So now it should say two. Bottom two, near bottom two. All right, and just for the sake of uh, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to take the minus one off. This should always get us to the bottom, so we should not get an error here. All right, good. Okay, so that's at the bottom. So that means if I do plus one here, we should walk off the end to get a null pointer exception. Oh. No steps, left depth plus one. Aye. Left depth. All right, so this should give us null pointers exceptions. Okay, there we go. Good. So now we can be confident we're in the right place. Minus 1 is the right place. Because we want to be what off the bottom. And because we wrote get max depth as a base 1, our numbers were a little confusing. So I think we just thoroughly tested where the bottom of our list is. So this should have us 1 off the bottom. Yep, right there. Right where we want to be, right? Okay. So this is our rebalancing thing. Now, one issue here, when we go back to this guy, I now know we need to go left, or I now know we need to go right. Got that part figured out. When I get to this part, I can then ask the question, do I need to go right or left? That tells me the other piece of the puzzle. Right? Okay. So once we get down to the bottom, here, we can go ahead and ask the next question. And let's start cleaning this up a little bit. I'm going to move that cur tree right before that. That way we have access to it outside of here. So both of these guys are going to effectively, uh, and actually I'm going to do it even better here. We're going to move, so we're calculating num steps there. We're calculating num steps here. So this code is always done in terms of num steps. Okay, good. So what I can do then is I can just take this for loop here that we just wrote, and I'm going to cut it from there. 
and I'm going to delete it from here. And then I'll paste it, run down the tree. So we'll just figure out are we left or right heavy here and then figure out how many steps we need to run. Then we'll actually run down the tree here. Okay, and we're running down in terms of num steps, and num steps is actually going to be a variable that we'll set right here int num steps, and we'll start off as negative one, but we know it's going to get set in one of those two guys. All right, so we should get our same output here, just with better programming. Okay. Now. When we're down the tree, when I get here, I'm near the bottom of the tree. Now we want to find out what is the final out of balance direction. So now we can go ahead and ask left heavy or right heavy. Make sense? All right. So we're going to use pretty similar stuff. So we'll say, uh, well, actually, let's just steal code from above here. We can certainly write this better, but let's just be explicit. So I'll go ahead and steal those two guys right there. Actually, I'm going to steal this whole thing. All right, so we'll reset left depth and right depth. We'll figure out where they are. If left depth is greater than right depth, then system.out.println. What I want to do, I want to do something different up here. So instead of printing out left heavy or right heavy, we're going to say string first. Start off as the empty string. Now we'll say first is left. And then we'll, well, we'll just leave it like that. Otherwise, first is right. Like that. Okay, so now when we're near the bottom, we have our depth. We know we're okay there, so I can get rid of that. Let's go ahead and give ourselves a variable for second as well, and then we'll print it out at the bottom. So there's second. Second is equal to left. Second is equal to right. Like that. And then we can finally print out algorithm to apply is first, right, we'll put a little dash in there, second. So here's right, 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 left, right, 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 so on and so forth. Make sense? Yeah. All right, so seems like a lot of work. And we haven't even rotated yet. <laughs> All we did is we figured out what the heck we have to do. All right, so now that we're kind of in the right, uh, the right world here, let's think about in the left-right case. So we want to be able to rotate left-right. 
To rotate left, right, we need three pieces. So I like to write these as actually individual methods, where we have three pointers to trees. Okay? So I know that, well, I, I say I know. I know I'm here. Okay? That this guy right here is Kerr, uh, what is it, Kerr tree? The very last time through, this is Kerr tree. Okay? So I have access to this guy. I need to get access to this guy. But I also need access to this guy. The guy right before Kerr tree. So I'm going to need to keep track of Preve tree as well. All right? So when I get down and I'm ready to do my algorithm, I want to know, I want to have the ability, I don't always need it, but I want to have the ability to have a pointer to this guy, a pointer to this guy, and then a pointer to this guy. Make sense? We need those three pointers. So I'm going to go ahead up here in our second pass through here. So that's where we start our cur tree. All right, so now let's set binary tree prev tree to start off being equal to null. Okay, we have no prev tree at the beginning because we're at the top. Okay, now as we start running through our tree here, before we update cur tree, we're going to set prev tree equal to cur tree. Set prev tree equal to cur tree. Make sense? So before we destroy cur tree, we're going to remember it inside of prev tree. When we finally break out of this, I have three pointers. Okay? This guy tells me what that second move is. Well, really I really have two pointers right now. I can grab my third. All right, so if I'm in, um, so if we want to go ahead and label these, we can say that this is A, B, and C. Okay, just A, B, and C for our rotations. Keep it consistent. All right, so when I get here, we can go ahead and say, binary tree A is equal to tree tree. Binary tree B oh, prev, prev tree, thank you. Uh, binary tree B is going to be cur tree. And then binary tree C is going to be determined down here, right? Okay, so if I am left heavy, okay, if I know the guy is to the left, so that would be um, right left, for example, this is cur tree, this is prev tree, I need to, well, sorry, this is um, A, this is B, we need to set C equal to B's left tree. Make sense? So if we're inside left, we're going to go ahead and we're going to say C is equal to B dot left. If I'm to the right, we're going to get B dot right. Aren't you glad I didn't give this to you for homework? I don't know. I guess your homework is what is on this one. Oh, that one's easily twice as hard as this. Really? No. That one is substantially easier to write. Okay. Yeah, nothing we're doing here is hard, but we're having to juggle a zillion things. So this is a really good exercise for in class to practice walking things and mess with pointers and stuff like this, but an inexperienced programmer is going to spend a lot of time, and what's going to end up happening is you're going to get lost, and you're not going to be able to get found. Um, that's what happens when you go through these guys, and that's why ABL trees are uh, a little bit tricky. I'm not a fan, usually, of giving them as assignments. Um, they're great in-class examples, and assignments is almost like unnecessarily tedious. 
That's probably the right word. It's tedious. It's not hard, it's just tedious. This other one is much more practical, and we'll talk about it. So this assignment isn't necessarily simple, but it's a much more practical thing, and you won't really get lost in the data structure. Data structure is much more straightforward. Same. Yeah, re rebalancing is, is complex. It's, it's the other yeah. yeah, they have a little bit different approach in how the rotations work, but rebalancing is just complex. Um, I think now I understand how the Delta class, but really you have to divide this part and consider a lot of time. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have our first and our second. This is going to tell us what we need to do, and then we have our A, B, and C. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is we're going to go ahead and, uh, let's see, we're going to write a function called apply algorithm. Let's, since we've done so much crap in here, let's make a private void apply algorithm. And we're going to have this guy take a string first, a string second, a binary tree A, binary tree B, and a binary tree C. Right, but we can make this generic. We already, we have the pointers. We, we have them, right? We have the three pointers. We're going to say, this is what you need to know to figure out what you need to do. Here's the pieces you might need to do what you need to do. Have at it. So essentially, we're passing crap out of here into here. So we can print out the algorithm we need to apply here. But really, what we're going to do is we're going to say this dot apply algorithm, passing it first, passing it second, passing it A, passing it B, passing it C. We'll just give them all those pieces that we just put all that effort into extracting. Yeah. So when we get in here, when we get here, we know which algorithm to apply first followed by second, and then we also know pointers to these three guys. Make sense? That's going to allow us to do the rotation in kind of a simpler mental state, okay? Because wouldn't you agree that this guy up here was starting to get a little verbose, a little bit complex, a little bit let's not touch that again because it seems to work? All right. So let's, uh, we'll go back down to this. So now we can kind of start with a clean slate. And what we're really implementing in here is these pictures. Yeah. Okay? We have A, B, and C, and we also know which, you know, is this left, right? Is it right, left? Is it left, left? Or is it right, right? All right? So let's go ahead and let's do the um, uh, simple rotations first. Simple rotations first. So if they're both left or they're both right, we're going to do the simpler of the rotations. All right. So we'll just go ahead and ask the question. So if first dot equals left and second dot equals left, do left left. Steal this. Else if they're both right, do right, right. Else, right, left, right, left. We can say else if, although we know the other reason we're in here. So, but we'll spell it out. I think we can determine if it's left first. Then, if we if we are doing left or right, we will definitely you know, we'll do a left or left in the in sequence. Yep, we will. So actually, we will. We can just do. Yeah, we're we're writing these first, anyways. We're going to write these two first anyways. We'll, we'll move these guys. I just wanted to give ourselves placeholders. All right. So idea here is, is that this is a left-left. This is a right-right. 
and these are the other guys. So I want to go ahead and I want to write a function specifically for doing left lefts. All right, so here's a left left case. In a left left case, we do not touch C, so we do not need C. Make sense? We just need A and B in order to do a left left. So let's go ahead and write private void uh, do left left and this guy will take a binary tree A and a binary tree B. That's all he needs to do his job. Okay? And what do we do for a left left? Okay, we need to preserve this guy. All right, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to preserve four's right tree. Okay, well, we're going to preserve B's right tree. All right, so we're going to need a binary tree, binary tree, B, RT, that's B's right tree. And this guy is going to be equal to B dot right. That could be null. Okay, that could be null right now, but it might not be. But in either case, we're going to now say b dot right is equal to null. That's our clean break. That is, rip this piece off, store it somewhere, and then set it to null. And we ripped it off whether it was there or not. Okay, we haven't checked for whether or not it actually had a null value or not, because it is possible for there not, not to be anything here. Okay. This is still out of balance, even if this is null. That makes sense? So we've tried to grab this guy. We may have just grabbed smoke and mirrors. We might have just grabbed the null value. And then we set it to null, so we might have redundantly set it to null. But in any case, we know that we've broken this branch if there was one on there off. Okay? So we have that. All right, so we've done that part, so that guy's loose. Now what do we do? Now we need to take a dot left become null. We don't have to do anything else. That's we just got to break this branch off, right? So a dot left is equal to null. So that will break that branch. Okay. Now what do we do? Okay. Now we we take b and we're going to add a to it. Okay? We have a weakness right now though. That's our weakness. We don't add binary trees. We add patient records. Look at our add function right now. Okay, we don't have to add a binary. So our add function, wherever it is. There we go. Yeah. Ours takes in a patient record and tries to add this guy, right? We need a version of this that takes in a binary tree. So private void add binary tree a tree. Oh, we'll call it the tree. I like typing that better. Okay, now when we add this, will we ever be replacing the root node? I'm sorry, will we ever be replacing the payload? Let's think how we're going to use this guy. We're going to take, we broke five off, we're going to add this whole tree, however long this is. Okay, we're going to add this whole tree into four. It would never replace this payload here, right? It's always just going to go on to a child branch, child branch, okay? So, um, well, let me ask you this. Is, well, let's see, we need to do it. Yeah, we want to add it. That would have been, otherwise that would have, that would have been bad advice, okay. So, we're going to say if, 
we need to grab the payload of this guy and then grab his age and find out should he go to my left or my right. All right. So if this dot, actually, let's say if the tree dot, uh, are we in a tree right now? Uh, we call it, yeah, we call it payload. So the tree dot, well, there it is, it just wasn't updating. Um, dot get age. If that guy is less than or equal to this dot payload dot get age. try to add left, else try to add right, okay? So now what do we do? Once we're in here, if we're going to try to add to the left, the first thing we could ask is, do I have a left subtree? So if this dot left is equal to null, this dot left is the tree. He becomes the tree. Else, this dot left dot add the tree. Okay. This dot right is equal to null, then this dot right is equal to the tree, else this dot right dot add the tree. Okay, so now we have the ability to add a binary tree to a binary tree. A little bit simpler than adding a payload. We don't have to ask as many questions. And we know this guy's only internally used, that's why we made it private. Okay. So. Where's my rebalance? Or actually, I'm looking for left, left, right? So do left, left. We preserved the right subtree. We um, overwrote A. So we preserved this guy. We broke this. Now we're going to add A to B. So B dot add A. B dot add A. A. Okay, so that will drop the five below the four. All right, then what do I do? Yeah, I could I could add that uh, that tree I preserved to the top, or I could also go ahead and add him to A, because because that saves us a little step. Right, because we know it'll immediately drop to the right, but we only want to do that if it's not null. So, if brt is not equal to null, then a dot add brt. That's our left left. Okay. That part looks simple. The hell leading up to that was less than simple. Okay? So that's left, left. So let's go ahead and write, right, right. Right, right, right. <laughs> okay? Right, right says to do what? It says we need to preserve... B's left. Okay, so right, right. B left tree is B dot left. Then set B dot left equal to null. Then we'll set A dot right equal to null. That breaks this off, right? Okay. Then we take B and we add A. Same exact thing, right? So we're going to add this guy to this guy. Same thing as we did before. 
because now we've broken off the pieces. Then what do we do? If blt is not equal to null, we'll say a dot add blt. Blt, that sounds good. It's bacon. BLT? Bacon, lettuce, tomato? I didn't have dinner tonight. That's probably that's also probably why I'm in a bad mood. I was, I was texting my wife during the break and like, like, man, I'm in a bad mood. I just spent a half hour yelling at these people. <laughs> I don't know. See, I used to get my Portillos when it was traveling up from Chicago, and I was always in such a good mood. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what Portillo's equals good grades, is that it? <laughs> I don't know if that's true. It certainly wouldn't hurt. You could say that hey, it's true, then you make that the wrong <laughs> Yeah, well, that's not very ethical. If I'm ye if I'm yelling at you for being unethical, <laughs> that's not setting a great example. Alright, so that's the right right. Alright, so now Let's write do left right. Yeah. I'm just going to put the left right underneath the left left, just for border's sake. And this guy needs all three, right? Yeah. Binary tree C. Okay, so he needs that stuff. And I'm going to go ahead and just get rid of the stuff in there just for right now. And then we're going to go ahead and we'll go ahead and give ourselves our placeholder for our right, right. Or our, our sorry, our, our right, left. Okay, we'll come back and we'll write right, left <laughs> shortly. All right, so here is what are we, we're doing left, right first, this guy. So we have A, B, and C at our disposal. All right, so our first step is what? We're staging it. We're basically converting left, right into left, left. Okay, so what do we do here? We take what ends up happening. We're going to disconnect B. So we already have C. Okay, this guy is free and clear, right? But we need to preserve B here. So C dot left we need to preserve. Okay. So we're going to say binary tree C left tree is equal to C dot left. Okay, we got that guy. All right, so we just preserved this piece. Then we're going to say B dot right is equal to null. B dot right is equal to null. So disconnect that. So that's now gone. Okay, now what? Okay. Uh, A dot left is null. Mm. Oh, because we're, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. A dot left is null for, for this move here. Okay, yeah. A dot left is also null. So we have these pieces floating, right? Yeah. This guy's disconnected from everything else. This guy's disconnected from this guy. Um, and this guy no longer has a left child, yeah. but we've preserved that. All right. So now what do we do? We're going to add C to A. Mm -hmm. So A dot add C. Mm -hmm. A dot add C. So that'll drop him in place. Then we can do C dot add B. B dot add the C LT. Yep. So then if CLT is not equal to null, B dot add CLT. Okay. 
But I'm not done rebalancing yet, am I? Okay. Now, you would suggest that maybe I can do this dot, what, do left left right in here. Okay. But the problem is, is now my nodes are out of order. Okay, so I need A and B, but my A and B is no longer the original A and B. Okay, my A and B is what? Now is A. I thought this is A is A. A is still A. A C B. But B is now C. So A and C. Nope, left left only takes two. Just pass them A and C. Make sense? So if I need to do a left right, do this. Okay. And then let's go ahead and let's uh, steal most of this for our right left. Right left, the staging says do what? First, we're going to preserve C's. C's right. Okay. So we're going to say C right tree is equal to C dot right. Then we'll say then we'll say B dot left is equal to null. Then we'll say A dot right is equal to null. Disconnect that. Then a dot add c, same line. Then c dot add b, same line. Then if c rt is not equal to null, then we'll do like that. And then we'll do a do right right. Still A and C? Yeah. Okay. All right. So those are those guys. All right. So now we wrote the rebalancings. So what do we do if we do a left left? We do this dot do left left A B. This dot do right right. A, B, this dot do um, right, left, A, B, C, this dot do left, right, A, B, C. So that should do our rotation. Make sense? All right, so here we figure out which algorithm to apply. Then we apply the algorithm that calls this guy down here, what apply algorithm. So this figures out whether or not the, uh, um, you know, which thing it needs to do. Then at the very end, let's do system dot out println did it work and we'll say binary tree dot top root dot is balanced so we should always get trues after did it work if it worked okay <laughs> row row Did it work true? Okay, so our left left worked fine. Our left right, right. rope. All right, we got some more runs there. Oh, wait, hold on. Left right did not always break. Apparently, we are all right left. <laughs> all right.
right, so left, left, worked. Left, left, worked. Left, right, worked. Left, left, worked. Left, right, worked. Left, right, worked. And then we had to do a right, left. Have we ever done a right, left before? No. That one time was right. All right, so all the left guys seem to work. Last time yeah, let's see if right guys work sometimes. No, no right guys yet. <laughs> oh, here, a right right worked, but a right left did not. All right, that ran all the way through. It did work. Oh, that's discouraging. <laughs> right, right, and right, left both worked that time. <laughs> it's got to be one little bug. Like right, left is where we failed there. All right, so... We failed on right, left there. I want to see if we ever fail on something other than right, left. We failed on right, right. Right, right. Hey, left, right. Okay, so it's got to be consistent what we're failing on. All right, so. It's always I have a get maximum depth. So. All right, so is the problem that we're calling get max depth, so this is on 50 and 54. Yeah, so I think maybe those algorithms are fine. It's our max depth that's actually breaking it. So here's 50, and here's 54. So if this dot right is not equal to null, then 1 plus this dot right, I get max depth. This would only be if it's not equal to null. So what's happening is we're in an infinite loop here. So this dot right is continually not equal to null. So somewhere we're not disconnecting. It's got to be in our algorithm here. It's got to be in our, our things that we just wrote, the left, left, the right, right. Somewhere we're not, we're not uh, guaranteeing something's disconnected. It's got to be not disconnecting something. Something must be looping back on something ahead. Oh, so the sequence may be not correct. All right, so let's see. So for let's just look at uh, let's look at left left because it's definitely failed on this before. So let's look at one of our simple cases and see if it becomes obvious. So let's get up to left, left in here. All right, here's do left, left. So first thing is we preserve B's right. And then we overwrite this with null. It's guaranteed to be null. Okay. But we don't know how complex this guy can be at this point. All right, so we'll save this, set this equal to null, fine.
then we set b's right tree equal to null. That's what we just did. Then we set a's left equal to null. So a's left is equal to null. So this guy no longer has a left tree at all. It's null. All right, so now this guy, so this is B. We have him held. We, we have him, him connected. We have him disconnected. So this is loose here. This is loose, almost loose. So we need to say B dot left is equal to null. So B dot... Oh, right, right, right. Okay, he, he travels with it. He travels with it. So on a left left, when we drag the four up here, the three drags along with it. Yeah, we don't touch the Okay. That stays the same. That's there. I want. I wonder. Is there a problem with us saying a dot add something? Is that breaking how it reconnects the tree? Because this is a, so we're saying a dot add this guy, uh, br what brt. We're adding it to a. But at that time we cannot go a from b already. Yeah, we already said it as now. We already said. So we're saying B dot add A. So when we add A to B, that dude is not using max depths, right? So how true. I don't think so for our trees. We're not, are we? Our new add. Yeah, maybe we should check our add tree. Oh, is it at the bottom? There's add patient record. Here's add tree. So add tree just asks, this guy doesn't do much. And we don't check this guy here. We don't check this guy. So we don't touch the very next Check left, right. Left, right. Next step. The, the the left right stuff. I don't I don't think that's going to be a problem. I mean the issue is is that line forty five fifty four fifty. Forty five. I think it just kind of was where it started, this left depth here. Um, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Could we possibly have... I wonder if this max thing is, that, is sometimes coming up with the wrong thing. Since we said 1 plus here, that should always work. That, that shouldn't break anything. Yeah, we really need to display our tree. There's some special case that we're just not we're we're missing. Let's go to the add the last 
261. The tree. Same thing. It's add right, add left. Well, not necessarily. This is just tracing where the, the problem started. So we call add, this comes in here. So yeah, the, the issue is, is that we're, we're in a situation where our right is not equal to null. So if right is equal to null, then we'll just set it equal to. This is our stop case. We're never getting into here. Otherwise, the issue is, is that right is not null. We're getting it. We're hitting this else over and over and over and over and over again forever. All right. So we're asking this here. Here we can. Problem is, since we can't predict when it's going to crash. Yeah, it's a little bit hard, little bit problem. Maybe we should try to uh, uh, manually add a tree in order to make the problem happen all the time. What I might do. I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about the homework assignment. So we could just debug this. I would say next week. Because I think this is mostly correct. Extra credit homework? Oh, I think that's actually a good idea. This is a pretty complex assignment. To... Yeah, if you find it, you'll get All right. I'll do that. So let me, uh, let's get this up on GitHub then. And I did say for this week's assignment, you have to turn it into GitHub, no more zip files. So GitHub's pretty easy. I do this over and over and over again. So pay close attention to what I'm doing here. So go into GitHub, create new, new repository. We're going to give this guy a repository name. So let's do CSC. 537, fall 2015, uh, AVL tree, that guy. So we'll create that repository, all right? Now, it tells you the commands you have to type in. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. All right, so, so let's, let's go and do this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get into the directory where this guy lives. So uh, let me... Uh, History, grep for CD. Tiny tree. Oh, here, patient tree is where it's actually stored, right? CD source, okay, so I'm going to do a git init, that creates it, then I'll do a git add star.java, then I'll do a git commit dash m initial commit. So now if I do a git status, it should show that we have three files that are being created. Oh, I committed them already. <laughs> if I had done that after the add. Okay, so now I'm going to Add my remote so I actually steal that line. We only have to do this one time. So there's that line. This just adds a variable that points to my git remote. And then finally, I push it to the cloud.
That's it. Okay, so pretty easy. So what I'll do here, so I'm also going to require you to use Slack. So if you're not on Slack, you don't get to do the extra credit. So in 537, I'll say for extra credit, find and fix the bug in our AVL tree implementation found at this guy. Make sure to explain the bug and how to reproduce it so we can fix it in class for everyone else. Submit this with your normal assignment for the week as a separate GitHub link with a with an explanation of how it works. All right, so this is a pretty hard problem. <laughs> um, well, I mean, we have most of it done. I'm pretty confident this thing mostly works. So uh, for those of you who have gotten some, some crap grades, spend time walking through code that already mostly works, figure out what the bug is. If you could fix it, I'll give you extra credit on one of your bad assignments. Sound good? All right. So uh, if you're not already on, here, I'll, I'll even do you another solid. Not already on uh, uh, Slack here. This is what you need to do. Go to slack.com. It's going to take you here. All right. Then go into sign in. Enter your Slack team's domain here. That's C-U-W-C-S. Don't create a new team. Join an existing team, C-U-W-C-S. When you hit continue, for me, it's probably going to log me in directly. My guess, oh, it doesn't. Good. This is exactly what you'll do. All right. Now you put in your C-U-W address. Make sure you use your C-U-W email. Otherwise, I won't let you into the team. Then pick your password. Hit sign in. Now you're in the team. All right, they'll even take you here on the website, so you don't even need to get the app if you don't want, but I suggest you go and get the app. It's on the phone. It's on the uh, all your computers. Once you come in, you'll see something like this in here. Go to 537, and you'll be sitting right in here. Make sense? And here is your AVL tree. Okay, so let's talk about the homework assignment. All right, we are doing a sparse matrix. All right, so everybody's going to want to pay attention here because this assignment can be tricky at first. All right, so we have this idea of a thing called a sparse matrix, i.e., a sparse matrix might look like something like this, okay? And that sparse matrix is mostly zeros. That makes sense, okay. Um, now, just so I don't forget, because I see he's recording me, I record all the lectures, so it's online. You can watch the videos. You guys are all aware of that. Yeah. All right. There's a link to it up there. You can record me. I don't care. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just making sure you didn't think that was your only opportunity to 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 get the uh, get the class. So yeah, feel free. I just wanted to make sure you're aware that. This is already recorded. I mean, every you get four hours a week of YouTube videos. It's for free. All right. So anyways, a sparse matrix is a matrix, you know, a linear algebra thing, filled up with mostly zeros. All right. But now what we want to consider is what types of things might we use a sparse matrix for. All right. Um, so as an example, if we're representing data that has a spatial 
uh, representation to each other. So for instance, let's say we're representing the United States. All right. Specifically, we want to represent all of the major airports in the United States. So let's say there's 10 major airports in the United States, big ones, you know, Chicago, LAX, the, the big ones. Okay, let's say there's 10 of them. And we want to have these guys stored in, a, in, in such a way that those airports are represented relative to the other airports. So we might represent the United States as a gigantic grid, okay? That's mostly empty space, since the only things we care about in this grid are the airports, okay? And maybe what our airports have is it, it's, it's like a, an airport population or a busyness rating or something like that. So maybe 10 is like the busiest, 9 is a little bit less busy, something like that. So maybe like the Atlanta airport is a 10. And like, you know, maybe New York and Chicago and LAX are going to probably be like nines, right? Uh, and then you're going to have some lesser guys, but, but you know, whatever. You know, the punchline is, is that that's the actual data that's in there is, you know, basically 10 individual numbers. One of them is a 10, a couple of nines in there, maybe some eights and sevens. And, you know, all the major airports are going to be busy. Okay? So maybe our smallest number is a seven uh, that we're going to have in there. But we're only going to have 10 numbers. But we want this thing to be representative of the entire United States. Um, so I'm trying to give you an extreme example here. It's representative of the entire United States where the distances spatially inside the, the, the matrix between Chicago's airport and New York's airport makes sense. It's to scale. So in the matrix, if the New York airport is kind of in the upper right-hand corner of the matrix, so we have our eight or our nine in the upper right-hand corner, kind of up in here, right? Mm -hmm. Chicago's is probably going to be kind of in the center and down a little bit, right? Yeah. LAX is going to be over on the, the left side and down a little bit, okay? So we want these guys to be representative, rep representative to each other spatially. Mm -hmm. And the distance between LAX and Chicago should be to scale so the amount of zero values that are going to be between Chicago and LAX is going to be gigantic, right? Yeah. So punchline here is, is this is what a sparse matrix is. It's when we need to represent things to scale, for example, in this case. But the actual num amount of data that we're actually holding is very small. In our example here, we're actually representing, let's just say, a million data points. Okay, well... We're representing a million entries in our matrix, but only 10 of them have data in them. Most of those points are zeros, but they have to be there for us to represent, for us to, to understand that Chicago is a close, is closer to New York than it is to LAX, something like that to give us some spatial feeling. So a matrix in and of itself is a data structure, right? Okay. But the problem is in a sparse matrix, it's a really, really, really inefficient data structure okay. because it's holding mostly nothing. But it has to still hold that crap because we, when we actually use that matrix to calculate something spatially, you know, we want to find out um, the, the distance between Chicago and New York, let's say. So another application of this might be GPS coordinates, that kind of stuff. All right we need to be able to explode this thing back out to its full matrix. But in general, if we're transporting this matrix, if we're sending the matrix from me to you via email, we want this matrix to be compressed, tiny, right? So that we can rebuild it on the other side. Okay, but we need to compress it, compress it, okay? So that's where these algorithms come into, into place. So read about how sparse matrices work. All right, we pretty much just explained it. They talk about some techniques for storing sparse matrices. So one of them is a dictionary of keys. Another one is a list of lists. Don't worry about the coordinate list thing here. So um, basically, dictionary of keys and lists of lists are okay for compression. So for instance, a list of lists stores one list per row. So in this example up here, actually, I think they give us, a, they give us an example down here for how it... Uh, List of lists works. Well, here, we'll we'll look at the example here. So, list of lists stores. Ah, here we go. 
one list per row with each entry containing the column index and the value. Typically, these entries are kept sorted by column index for faster lookup. Um, so they talk about this as incremental matrix construct construction. So we'd have a linked list here with four linked lists in it. It's a list of lists, all right, for our list of lists. This is the easy implementation. We're not writing this one. We're writing the hard one, Yale. All right, this one's scary. So that's why we're, I'm doing that for homework. But um, <laughs> all right, so list of lists is going to say we're going to have a linked list containing four linked lists for this guy. Each of these linked lists uh, will uh, contain the column index and the value um, of the actual values that are stored there. Okay, so this first linked list will be empty. The second linked list will have two entries in it, five at position zero, eight at position one. The third linked list will have just one entry in it, three at position two. And then the fourth one will have one entry in it, six at position one. All right, so we have a linked list where each row only stores the non-zero values. Okay, it stores, so for this row right here, it stores nothing. There are none, there are zero non-zero values in this row. This guy, there are two non-zero values. For this value five, it's going to keep track of that it's in column zero. So this is going to be a value column pair. So if we were to actually write this out, let me just open up Keynote here real quick. Uh, yeah, oops, okay. So list of lists, that's how they, um, we're going to have four linked lists. So in this example, we'll have four linked lists. And then I'll write what each list looks like. The first list is going to be the empty list, nothing. Second list is going to be a list containing two things, five and eight. So this is going to be five comma zero. So let's do five colon zero. And then let's do eight colon one. Those are the only entries in that second list. Third list is going to have one entry, three at index at, at column two. Three at column two. The last one is going to have one entry, six at column one. Okay. One last thing is we're going to remember that this is a four by four matrix. So somewhere we need to store rows and columns. So a list of lists is going to have rows is equal to four, calls is equal to four. So we know that given this list of lists, I need to build a four by four grid. This is the non-zero values in row zero, so I can just blow it out to four zeros. These are the non-zero values in row one, so I know I have stuff at position zero and position one, so I'll put two extra zeros there. Three is the only value in uh, bucket two of row three, so uh, row two in our linked list, so there'll be zero, zero, three, zero. This guy will be zero, zero, six, zero, zero as we're rebuilding it. So this is a compressed way of holding that linked list. All right, so we're storing two pieces of information, rows and columns, a linked list containing four linked lists, and each of those linked lists only holds the non-zero values. That make sense? And where they live in the grid, what column they live in. So given these pieces of information, we can then rebuild that matrix. So this is a compressed format for this, okay? But it's not a it's not one of the more efficient ones. That's where the Yale algorithm comes in. Okay, so let me talk about this real quick. It should only take a, a couple minutes. Yale algorithm. This guy actually uses only arrays. That's it. No linked lists, no stacks, no queues, just arrays. Okay, 
Very special how he uses those arrays. The first array, A. Up here it explains each of these, the A array. What this guy holds is all of the non-zero values in the order that you would hit them in the grid. So a 5, an 8, a 3, a 6. 5, 8, 3, 6. Make sense? The second array here um, will have a number of entries in it equal to the number of columns. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Erase the number of columns part. The number of rows. This is kind of a weird example because the rows and columns are the same. Okay, but it is the number of rows. So if this was 50 columns and four rows, this guy would have size five. Number of rows plus one in size. Okay? And this is the important one. This is the difficult one. All right? What this guy tells us is he tells us where the first element in that guy exists. All right? And then... Uh, and I'll, I'll explain that here in a second. This last guy here is kind of redundant. That just tells us the size of this array. So he's actually not even necessary for this algorithm, but it's part of the formal Yale algorithm. Okay, so now, these are all the numbers we have to place. This is where those numbers start on each row. So in row zero, we're going to go from zero to this value minus one, placing values from this array. So basically, from zero to negative one means we don't have any values here in the first row. I have nothing to place. For loop, for int i equals zero, keep going as long as i is less than negative one, i plus plus, we won't even try to do anything. So because both of these guys are zero, we don't actually try to do anything in this first row. Second row, we'll kind of show you the algorithm. So now, here's our second row. So IA is information about a row. So this zero says that in the second row, the first position of the first non-zero number is at column zero. That's what the zero means. Okay? But now if we look ahead, okay, we look ahead, we can see that the next value is at column two in the next row. Does that make sense? So... He's at column two in the next row. Now, if we look down here at this guy, we see that the five is in column zero. The eight is in column one. The three is in column two. The six is in column one. So this last guy tells us what column each of these values are in. So this array and this last array are associated with each other. First one says all the values. The second one says what column should we find that value in? And then this, this middle guy, this is the important one. This guy tells us how do we place those guys relative to what rows they're in. So I know that I'm going to go through from 0 to 2 minus 1. So that's bucket 0 to bucket 1 in this guy and place both of those in row 1. Okay? Because I know we start at zero, and the next guy, this tells me which position up here is the first value. So in IA, this is row zero, this is row one, this is row two. In row two, the very first non-zero number is the element at bucket two up here. Which means everything before bucket two up there should come before row two. All right, so if this value right here is in row three, and he's the first value in there, we know that these two values must come earlier in the rows. They're either in row zero or row one. All right, so when I get right here and I say, oh, Five is the first element that's in row one. Fine, that's the index of this guy. So bucket zero up here is a five. And I know that in the next row, the first element is three. That means I know for this row, five and eight both need to get placed. And I know where to place them. Five should go at index zero. Eight should go at index one. 
5 is in column 0, 8 is in column 1. Next row, 3 is in column 2. And do I have to place anything else on this one? Nope, because the 3 starts at 2, and the next row, the first element is 3. So this guy is going to be in the next row, so the only thing I have to place on this row is a 3. Does that make sense? So we use this array to tell us, relatively speaking, how many of these values do I have to place for the current row I'm building. This array tells me the value. This array tells me which column we need to put that value. This array tells me what row I'm placing that value at that column. Okay? So that's kind of the description of it verbally. So if you go back and watch this video, in lieu, as well as read through this, you'll, you'll uh, hopefully come up with the, the, the solution for this. Now, one thing I'll warn you about, especially in light of the fact that uh, we've been taking things off the web, um, there is an implementation of the Yale algorithm out there that does it wrong. It's like a perfect little uh, Trojan horse, actually. <laughs> it doesn't do it the right way. This is the correct description of how Yale algorithm works, as well as if you do some research on it, you'll find the paper from yale.edu that describes the Yale algorithm. Both of those guys do it this way. That's the correct Yale algorithm. The other one is significantly easier to follow because it's a lot like our list of lists. All right, questions, comments, concerns, bribes? Why don't we use Well, you, you could use a two-dimensional array to represent your, your original matrix. But this is the... So let's say that there were a million points in here. This guy would still be pretty small. I mean, the, I, the concept of the Yale algorithm is a compression algorithm for sparse matrices. You can represent a gigantic matrix in just three relatively small arrays. Because these arrays... Between these three arrays, all the information you need to reconstruct the original matrix is there. Make sense? All right. So I'll stop the recording. We can look at your stuff.